last 17 years. So it's an honor for me to be here with you guys. And I hope we're going to have a great time together in this class because I'm going to talk, but you're also going to participate in this class. Okay, so we're all going to put together a great morning this Friday mornings. Fridays are good, right? Because weekends come in. And so you're going to learn. We're going to have fun. And we're looking forward to uh, this presentation. I'm very happy if you interrupt me at any time. Okay? Good. So let me start uh, talking about kind of the agenda. I mean, I've given by now a number of uh, talks on, uh, on the COVID crisis. And, uh, and I, I'm going to talk about a number of issues related to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. What kind of shock it is for the economy? What is the difference between the 2008 crisis? Anybody has heard about the 2008 crisis yeah. and the 2020 uh, COVID-19 crisis? We'll then focus about the case of Sca uh, Spain. This has been a global crisis, but Spain has been uh, severely affected, as you know. Then we'll talk about something that we economists do you know, uh, for a living, because I'm a professor in economics, economics and finance, which is, OK, once there is a problem, how to kind of solve that problem, how to mitigate the consequences of the problem. Hello? Good. So, uh, so that has to do with the policy response, the policy measures to address, to address uh, COVID-19. And then we'll talk about impact and recovery, and then emerging markets and financial markets. To be honest, this is a presentation I give, you know, typically it's an hour and a half. I understand we have 50 minutes. Almost, almost an hour, so maybe we will not reach. I mean, if you're especially interested about the last two topics, I can move on to them. Uh, but I think we will stop here in impact and recovery. Okay? Good. Any questions you have by now? No. Okay. So what kind of shock is the COVID-19? Okay, what kind of shock? Okay, anybody telling me. What's your name? You are? Alvaro Atienza. Alvaro. Oh, I think it's an external shock. It's an external shock. External to what? It's not a crisis that has some, uh, some any type of um, uh, economical disruption. It is something that comes from outside. It's a virus. Right? This is this is I think a good a, a very good point. I mean this is not something that is happening from the structure of the economy, from firms, from the government, from banks. It's something that comes outside. It's what we call in economics exogenous shock, exogenous health shock. So it actually it was a very good a very good answer, Alvaro, right? Very good, very good point. Okay. So it's indeed, it's indeed external. Um, and I say here it's initially a supply shock. It's, it's initially a supply shock. So why is it a supply shock? I mean, supply, demand, I know that now you're very well aware of what is the, you know, what, what both uh, demand and supply consist of. If you think about it, once the COVID hits the economy, uh, think about China, which is where everything started. Well, business stop right because the immediate consequence of the COVID shock is that people have to be distanced from each other right has to be they have to be distanced from each other right so not only that because it was very severe people say well you know we have to be we have to stay at home so businesses have to stop right because businesses in businesses people have to go in person yeah. right so businesses have to stop now Look at this expression here. Global supply chains are disrupted, have to stop. What does that mean? Global supply chains have to, are disrupted. And why can that, for instance, happen in China and affect Spain? Well, think about, uh, you know, Spain. You know, Spain, what is, what is the main thing that Spain exports, the main, the main uh, industry, you know, aside from tourism? You know what's the main industry? What, what's the good that Spain exports? the most in terms of volume of exports? Olive oil. Yeah. Olive oil. And, but it ex actually, Spain exports a lot of cars because Spain actually produces a lot of cars. There are many foreign firms that produce cars in Spain. You know why? Tell me an ex Yes. Cheaper. Because it's cheaper. Labor cars are cheaper. The French, the German, you know, the British, they came here in the 80s and set up plants, right? Good. So uh, think about, for instance, around Madrid, or I live in Pamplona. In Pamplona, there is a large firm, a large Volkswagen uh, uh, firm, which produces 
Apollos, and now some other models too, and they're going to produce an electric car too. And, uh, and this is disrupted because of China. Why? Because some of the parts of the cars that they need from other countries. This is in globalization. There is this interconnection, right? So here we produce cars, but to produce cars, you need wheels, steering wheel, you need, you know, the, uh, you need material for the seats, you need uh, materials for their condition, you need the engine, of course, you need many parts of the car, and not all of them are produced in Pamplona. Some of them come from different countries, and they are assembled, integrated in Pamplona, and then in Pamplona the, the car is produced. And the same thing you could think of, let's say, Citroën in Vigo, or you could say with uh, Opel in Zaragoza, or you could say we're an old in Valladolid. Okay. Now, if all of a sudden uh, uh, China stops, some of those parts have, uh, um, have to, uh, you know, um, some of those parts don't reach, don't reach Spain, cannot produce any more cars. Right? So initially it's, it's a, a, a supply shock because uh, businesses have to stop. Especially in large firms, this is not right. Right, but then it induces an important demand shock too. Why is that? Why is that? Well, first, because supply falls, so there is less demand of goods and services for firms, uh, less investment, less imports, less trips. I mean, supply, when there is less supply, there is less demand. You can think about it in, in a regular demand and supply graph, right? But there is another demand shock, which is the falling. Well, look, if we are about a year ago, which is when the economy, all of a sudden, and this is very important, living a lot of uncertainty so, and uh, uh, influence the economy and, and what is that uncertainty about why is that uncertainty with the crisis a, a year ago okay yes that's Sir, that's exactly right. The problem is that, uh, you know, th that shock, which a year ago, it was very much unknown what the consequences were going to be and how long it was going to last, it affected uh, many people, right? And affected firms. And some people, many people working said, well, look, what's going to happen with my firm? Are they going to lay me off? You know, they're going to fire me. Or what's going to happen? How long is this going to last? Now, more or less, with the vaccine, we have a sense that maybe the second part of this is going to improve. But a year ago, we didn't really know. We didn't really know. So when that happens, there is a lot of uncertainty. And then people have to save, as he said, right? So you behave in a way in which you say, well, look, you know, for whatever may happen, I'm going to save for a rainy day, right? I'm going to save for a rainy day, right? So if you think about it, then there a fall in supply and a fall in demand, right? So what is the of fall in supply and fall in demand? The crisis, production of income, production of GDP, production. Uh, by the way, do you know how much GDP has fallen last year? 30. 30? No, that's, that's too much. Probably going to be around uh, 11 or 12% or 12 percent in a year okay so that's uh so that's it. now uh it's a global shock it's a global recession we just gave an example here of a car plant in spain that receives from many places and therefore has and it's a global recession and that affects a country like spain we're gonna see why why is spain very much affected by by a crisis like this well, for one reason, I mean, our industry is very connected in the global supply chains, like I said, for instance, car production. Uh, but also, uh, think about a, a big industry in Spain, tourism. It's very much affected by a crisis like this, okay? Because all of a sudden, people cannot come here, then a big source of income of Spain doesn't, uh, uh, well, cannot, cannot operate. Now, another feature is that the shock is very much unexpected, right? This is what Alvaro was saying is external. It's definitely, definitely unexpected. And, uh, and this is obviously the case. I mean, some people are saying, oh, well, 
you know, there is a pandemic every 12 months, every, sorry, <laughs> every 100 years, right? We had one, the Spanish flu, about 100 years ago, so the pandemics were there, right? Uh, indeed, I mean, I don't really like tennis, but a Wimbledon tournament, they had an insurance against pandemics, right? So they, in a way, they were expecting that, let's say, you know, over the course of 100, 150 years, I don't know, I don't know for how long the tournament has gone, but that this could happen, and they were paying every year one billion pounds, and all of a sudden, they received the money of the insurance because there was a pandemic and they didn't uh, celebrate the tournament because they were receiving, you know, all the, all, all the payments of the company. But apart from some people who were saying that, and, and people didn't expect a pandemic. Moreover, nobody, nobody knew when the pandemic was going to come and nobody knew where it was, it was going to come. So it's really unexpected, it's something that is external and expected right which is something typical of economic of economic shocks now it also has an immediate impact okay and this is something that is different from other other crises is that well business to stop immediately right because for health considerations for health reasons you um you cannot uh, continue producing right so you have to stop you have to go home and firms have to close Right? So this is similar to what is called a natural disaster uh, type of shock, which here, for instance, in Spain we don't suffer much, but many countries do suffer natural disaster type of shock. Okay. Uh, other, kinds of, other kinds of crises. Yeah. Good. Uh, natural, so natural disaster type, basically the impact is immediate right and then the recovery it depends how fast it can be okay <coughs> okay let me now <coughs> make a, a comparison between 2008 and the COVID-19 crisis okay 2008 if I tell 2008 crisis what uh, bell does it ring what bell does it ring you, you haven't spoken yet what's your name Ignacio. Ignacio yes what bell does it ring 2008 crisis economic crisis Fall of investing, what kind of investing? We can talk about different kinds of investing. From um, uh, I can't really find the word. But, um, and different companies in order to make them grow and to earn a profit from their investment. So investment, what is investment? If I build a plant to produce, for instance, uh, olive, you know, to produce olive oil, is that investment? Yes, that is investment in real goods, real economic activity. But you're talking about other kind of investment, about 2000 prices. What kind of investment are you talking about? Shares. Buying shares, financial investments. That's right. So 2008 crisis had to do with financial investments, okay? And, and that's, what, that's the origin of the, co of, of the shock, right? And it was internal to the economy. You know, Alvaro was saying, you know, right, the COVID shock is external, it's exogenous. That was in a way endogenous. It was building up in the in the uh, financial sector of, of the economy, right? So that's a different kind of investment, investment in financial assets, okay? That's the investing, let's say, in real economy goods, such as cars, olive oil, or, or houses, right? The housing investment, I mean, it, it's, it's also real. So 2008 shock is a financial shock that affects the real economy. Okay, this is, this is the origin, right? So you think about uh, 2008, maybe some think about Lehman Brothers. Have you heard about Lehman Brothers? What was Lehman Brothers? Did they make olive oil? No, what were they making? Financial products, okay, so to speak. And then it collapsed. And then it brought down a lot of firms, okay? Now, it brought down a lot of firms because there were many banks, so to speak, that were bankrupt and therefore they couldn't then companies that were making olive oil or cars or houses so all of a sudden there is a transmission from financial firms that collapse to the real part of the economy oh oh this is great now i realize this is great great screen yeah this is a great screen yeah okay good put here so uh financial shock affecting the real economy COVID-19 is a real economic shock, affects many sectors and financial markets. So it's the opposite direction, okay? Something that happens 
you know, it's a health shock that immediately makes firms stop, right? And it's affecting many sectors. And then because of that, it's going to affect the returns, the profits of firms, also banks, because banks all of a sudden, they're going to be uh, under strain because some of the loans are not going to be repaid, are going to default. Okay. So this is one way to understand the difference between 2008 crisis and the COVID-19 crisis, right? 2008 goes from finance to real economy. COVID-19 goes from, from real economy to many sectors and also financial markets. And going forward, for instance, this year, if you've been following the media, uh, these weeks there's a lot of talks, for instance, by the Spanish government about how is the Spanish government going to help firms that are in debt, right? They have a lot of debt, they've been borrowing, and now they cannot pay back, right? So now, now the government and the general governments are trying to avoid that the financial markets are very much affected by, by the real economy shock. A different physiognomy, right? So that word that really is very, you know, ugly, physiognomy, different, different nature, you could say. 2008, the epicenter of the crisis, was few large systemic firms. Lehman Brothers, Citigroup, four, five, six, some large uh, real estate uh, companies that were houses. So you could focus on, on, on six, eight, ten firms, and you could say, well, if we fix these firms, then the problem more or less will be solved. Okay, it's a nice movie. There were a lot of movies about 2008 crisis. I don't know if you've seen one, but one of them, one very nice one, too big to fail. And, and that's very clear in that movie when, let's say, the Minister of the U.S., Secretary of Treasury, with the 10 largest banks. That's a great scene in the movie because you, say, you see that the government was trying to address the 2008 crisis, so helping or solving the crisis of 10 firms, all of them financial. Now, 2020 COVID-19 crisis is very different, right? Because it's very disruptive for many small firms, right? So many small firms are affected because they have to close, right? Remember here the Estado de Alarma, emergency state, or uh, the fact that, for instance, now still in a situation where uh, shops, uh, well, can uh, some, some, some businesses, for instance, restaurants, bars, everything, they have to close at 11, things like this. So they have their activity reduced, so many of them are not having uh, you know, good economic results. So many of them are affected, and the small firms, especially in some sectors like we so, so it's more challenging to address this problem when many small firms have to be uh, rescued. So rather than meeting with 10 largest firms, as in 2008, now governments are making laws to address the problems of many small firms, right? So it's different logistics, okay, to uh, really address this problem, right? Now, the COVID-19 crisis in principle is going to be more transitory. Yesterday I read a report that uh, despite this year Spain dropping 11% uh, 11 in GDP, it is, um, I mean, uh, calculations point at, at a drop of GDP that is going to be 25% the drop of GDP of the 2008 cri crisis. So much smaller. These are the forecasts now, right? Uh, and let me show you this graph, which I think is a very nice graph about comparing 2008 crisis versus the two, two 2020 uh, pandemic, right? Now look at this. The, two, the 2008 crisis, right? So in yellow you have uh, the GDP and in dash red lines you have kind of the trend, the trend of the economy. See how the 2008 crisis, what it did uh, was to lower the GDP, you have it here, and then it's been below the trend for a long time, right? This is what we call economic hysteria. It's a very permanent shock, very permanent shock. And you see all these are in GDP. This is the case of the US, it was the case of Spain that was very much affected by the 2008 crisis. We mentioned that Spain has been hit uh, in a way, it's it's poor, but it, it is what it is. And so that you see that permanent drop. Now, COVID crisis, you see here more like a V, an asymmetric V affects the economy, right? So it's a drop, you know, a very short fall 
says they're very front loaded of GDP. So, and then it kind of returns to normal after some quarters, after some years. Okay, so what is different about, um, about the COVID crisis is that, well, there is a large drop in the beginning, larger than here, right? Because firms had to stop, literally, you have to stop. Therefore, you cannot produce, and therefore you cannot employ people. Therefore, it's a very large drop, right? Now, the return to the trend will be there, unlike in the 2008 crisis. So the overall output was here, although here I don't, I don't have a computation, but it's gonna be smaller than this. It's gonna be smaller than this. So in a way, once we fix the external problem that Alvaro was talking about, then it, we will be relatively fine because there was, let's say, nothing internally that was broken in the economy, right? Because the shock was external. So once you fix that external shock, then the economy should keep on. We hope, right? Because in the process, some firms have disappeared and, and, and this is, we're still grappling with this right now, but hopefully, you know, the economy can go back to normal say next year or so to where we were uh, in, in 2019. So you see that this is more transitory, this is more permanent. I'm not going to elaborate why, why 2008 was more permanent, but basically if the crisis that come in financial origin tend to be very persistent and are very persistent because a very important part of the economy is damage, which is the financial sector. If many firms depend on the financial sector and the financial sector is broken, Firms have a tough time going forward. They don't find, they don't find funding, and therefore, you know, many firms have to have to close. Okay, good. I don't know if you have any question about this, but I'll just continue. Good. The case of Spain. Okay. So, state of emergency puts a break on the economy. Really, this is something that, in a way, so you have the external shock, and then the government, by law, stop the economy. Right. Remember, I was living there at the University of Navarra in in a Colegio Mayor, like having a, a great time, and all of a sudden, the government uh, decided, hey, you, uh, you cannot get out of home, remember? You had to stay at home, right? You remember, how do you remember that? It was fun, it was not fun? You guys were following classes online or something? Right. Yeah, so I'm a professor, I, was a, I, I started to give a lot of classes online too, you know, and uh, it was an amazing time, I remember, so actually a lot of people returned home, not everybody, so we stayed, we're, 100 in our Colegio Mayor, so now then you stay 35. We actually, uh, it, was, it was very funny, we had a great time. We remember it as, as, as a really great time where we got very close together with, with the other students and the other professors who live there. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is that the economy had to stop, right? Only uh, essential economic activities such as food and, 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 and other industries uh, could operate, right? So the rest of the economy had to stop and therefore uh, economic activity was very much uh, damaged, uh, and especially the strategic sector, right? So we're talking about Spain. So tourism, hotels, restaurants, car manufacturing, uh, SMEs, what SME stands for? It's an acronym. PYME, yes, small and medium enterprise, small, it's an acronym, small and medium enterprise, PYME, very good. That, that's, what, that's what it is. Self-employed, what is self-employed? Autonomous, you see, autonomous, for instance. Like some people now, also in my colleague Mayor, are starting their own businesses. They're producing, let's say, some vests or some uh, bags or some uh, um, sweaters. Well, they're self-employed, right? And there are many, okay? So they are very much, uh, very much affected, uh, strategic sectors affected. You see here, what are the sectors in Spain that, 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 uh, that have a larger share of GDP, uh, pay base, GDP, unemployment? And you see there, tourism, 15%, maybe the last column. If you put together the last column and the first column, I think we can uh, have a better view of overall view of what's going on. 15% tourism, 14% construction, health, 12%, uh, trade, 12%. Finance eight, agriculture five, car five, banking four, mining one. So you see here, there is uh, these uh, two or three sectors that are very severely affected, you know, uh, with the COVID crisis. Okay, who can tell me? What what are the out of these sectors, which is the one that is most affected by? Yes, tourism, tourism for sure. another one. Yeah. 
construction, especially in the beginning, then it really resumed. Yes, you want to say? No. Also, commercial, right? Because many shops had to, had to close, right? So they're also affected, right? So now, for instance, if you go to the airport, you see there used to be, <laughs> there are a lot of shops there. Uh, everything, I mean, every, it's, it's shocking, right? Or you go to the train, I, I was coming yesterday to a train, train station, most shops closed. I mean, and this is a big, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big part of the Spanish economy. So strategic sectors, important sectors are affected, right? And, uh, and especially, we're talking about SME, small firms. You see here, percentage of employment in companies with less than 50 people working, right? So actually, uh, this is m most of the firms are less than 50 workers. Eh? By the way, most of the firms right, are, are SMEs, okay? And you see, for instance, in Greece, almost 80% of the firms are like that. And you see Spain, almost 60% of the firms are small. And they are very much affected and they have to stop. So a strategic part of the economy is very much affected. Now, here when we're at the School of Economics, I, to my students at the university, I always uh, tell them about the difference between actual economic growth and potential growth. Have you heard about this difference? Growth versus potential, right? or GDP minus potential GDP. This is very important variable in macroeconomics. GDP minus potential GDP, right? So what is the potential? The potential is how much you can produce if your economic factors are fully employed, if everybody works, if all the machines are operating, if all your technological resources are operating too. Okay, that's the potential. Now, you think about it, part of the potential of the Spanish economy in the light of those sectors, what is potential what, what do we have a lot of potential in <laughs> at least we find tourism, tourism. That's because we have great weather we like we may like it or not because we would like to have a more technologically oriented uh, economy and it is something that we could think about moving in the future but let's face it I mean we have a lot of potential for tourism we've had it and we will have it just because our weather our facilities and we are oriented towards that so all of a sudden our potential growth vanishes, at least in the short run, because it will come back, right? When the crisis is gone, it will come back. But in the short run, it's very effective. And this is immediately in, in, in March, April, we knew that the Spanish economy is going to be more affected, let's say, than Germany. Why? The base of Germany is not tourism. That's right. They're not so focused on tourism. They're focused on some sectors like technology or cars or something that they can activities and therefore GDP uh, drop is not going to be as large and the same thing we can say about other countries right which are not Germany you know they're not as affected as we are right so if the potential growth falls then the, the actual growth uh, goes with the potential it's, it's very much aligned with the potential right now we're going to see now a little bit about the impact in the financial sector uh, of the economy vo both variable income and fixed income okay financial sector a variable income finance what is that shares. shares and fixed income bonds okay bonds you know what is a bond yeah. bonus. bonus yeah what is it and why who can issue a bond can i issue a bond no sorry companies can issue bonds yeah very good the state the co that's right that's, that's exactly right the government uh, uh, and companies typically right and then some uh, agencies some institutions can also Issue bond. Banks can issue bonds, they issue large banks, especially. Okay, okay, good. So that's, that's fixed income, right? So what happened in Spain with uh, variable income finance? This is IBEX 35. This is uh, actually, the, the stock market in Spain had not done very well in 2018, 2019. And 2020 was beginning relatively okay, you know, from 9,500 uh, 9, to to 10,000, we were doing okay, actually. Yeah? It, was, it, it, it was a promising year, actually, for the, for the stock market in Spain, the IBEX 35, you all know it, right? It's the, it's the index of the 30 largest firms. So this is not the whole Spanish economy, by the way. These are just 35 firms, the largest ones, the ones that are not small that we were talking about before, right? But in a way, it's representative of the largest firms, how they are doing, right? And it was promising, I mean, you know, 500 uh, points in, in about a month, about a month and a half. You see, even before, uh, even before, let's say, the emergency state, which was March 14th or 15th, 
which is here, even before that, stock market started to go down. And this is a good example about what? About, yes. Yes, but the fear came one month before. Why? How we depend on other economies. That's right. How much we depend on other economies? Because we're seeing what was happening where? In China, and then yeah. Italy, and then about the third country. Or we were one of the first countries. Well, there was other ones, sorry. There was Korea was affected before us and some other countries. But, but we were seeing this, and we are connected. If those countries are not doing well, we're not doing well. And then people were selling shares. There was fear, and people sell, and then the stock price goes down. Right? And it, it went down by a lot. From 10,000, oh, no worries. From 10,000 to 6,000. What is that in terms of percentage? This is numbering, if you like economics or finance. 40%. 40% in about a month or month and a half. That is annually, you have to multiply by 12, right? Because when you, for instance, in bond interest rates, you compute annual interest rates, right? So 40% in a month and a half, there's huge losses, okay? Huge losses. And then since then, it has somewhat recovered. I think now we are, I can't remember where we are, but we are about 1,700, uh, uh, sorry, 7,500, something like that. Uh, I, I'm not for exactly how much it is, right? So huge effect, right? And then we're part of the European Union. The European U Union was very affected. Huh? And then this is an important part. And now we're moving to how we dealt with the crisis is many of the tools to fight against the crisis were in the hands of the Europe of our European Union. Why? Give me an example of who has the tool to combat the crisis. Vaccines. Vaccines, this is good, actually, because the vaccine, they say, program has been run by the European Union, and then they've been purchasing uh, for us. But other institutions, the European, Central European Central Bank, which is based in Frankfurt, they are the ones lowering interest rates, putting more money into the economy in order to address all these problems, right? So there is a shock, and then because we're part of the European Union, European Union really is going to be a big player helping us. Also, the national government is going to do policies, but the European uh, Spanish government, without the support of the European institution, cannot do much, right? Indeed, right, we've been part of this EU reconstruction fund, which was negotiated in May, June, and finally, I think it was very successful, the fact that we are going to be able to receive 140,000 billion uh, uh, euros, well, depending on kind of the different projects, half of it is going to be direct transfer, the other half is going to be debt. Okay, we're going to borrow. Okay. Policy measures, okay. Uh, let me go through. Okay, this is uh, actually a, uh, a um, graph that I did. Actually, I was doing in, 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 in March when this was happening. I was thinking, well, how do we have, because I, I, I do macro policy. I'm also advising the, 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 the Spanish, uh, the Bank of España, and I'm working with them. And, and I was thinking in my head, okay, how can we, you know, because in a way the economies are like doctors, right? Now you have a patient which is sick. How can we, you know, fix the economy? We, this, we can fix this patient. And then immediately I thought about this roadmap of addressing the challenge of the COVID-19, right? So there had to be kind of immediate phase one measures to address to address all these uh, all these problems, here I distinguish uh, three kinds of measures. You see, fa uh, here in phase one, national government fiscal support, right? The S, which is to give funding to firms so that they don't completely lay off workers. Uh, loans, public collateral, subsidies, uh, fiscal moratoria, which is to help firms to pay uh, taxes later. Things like this. These are called uh, these are called fiscal policy social insurance because to say, well, if you are in trouble, don't worry now to make your payments. You can defer them, or I can give you some subsidies. And this was in the hand of the national government. Now, in the middle is the most important immediate measure. It's the one we've all uh, really uh, experienced, and that was the key one, right? It's the public health measure, virus detention confinement test, right? So we have to stop, we have to stay at home, right? To uh, social distance, and then that was key, right? So this is the connection here. To help the economy, you needed public health. So the connection between 
public health and economics has been there since the beginning of the crisis and is really it at the center. So that was actually the most immediate and the most important measure is to stop the spread. Okay, and here below we have the European measures, the ECB, monetary policy. What did the ECB do? Did they lower interest rates? No, because they were negative and at zero. Uh, so injected liquidity and they gave lending and funds to governments, to firms, and to many institutions to basically assure that, well, they're going to have money. So to also banks, you know, bank regulations, also banks have more leeway with this. Now, the, the, the idea is that, well, according to the first, w w once we got out of the first phase, let's say, of the crisis, let's say May, June, we would start the recovery, okay? We would start the recovery. And then we move, on, we move on to phase two, how to restart the economy, right? In a way, this is a crisis that's not in the textbooks because it's, let's freeze the economy for three months and then let's reopen it. There was an external shock. I have to take, you know, the refrigerator, I have to, or, or I, I have to put the economy in the refrigerator and then we would put the economy back again out of the refrigerator after three months, restart the economy, right? But it's so easy. Right? It's not so easy because, well, all of a sudden there's been a lot of disruptions and, and, uh, and people, and because of what I said, the demand shock, people are very, cons they, they're very uh, risk averse, they don't want to consume, there's not the same demand, not the same supply, so pff, it takes time, right? And also in the second phase, health safety has been key. Well, look, it's happened since last summer to today. We've had another waves of the of, of the pandemic, right? So health safety has been there. We still are normalized in terms of health safety. We are not normalized, okay? Uh, in the meantime, there have been some programs like aggregate demand investments or a construction fund that I talked about, maintain expansive expectations and do not increase tax to firms, okay? The, uh, the government has taken control there. Uh, and here you see two of programs that the governments have made. Uh, in red, you have fiscal spending, and in, in green, you have loan guarantee. Who can tell you what loan guarantee is and why it has been important here? Yes? Because you're not gonna be, you don't have to give back the money they have lent you in a lot of years. Many firms borrow, uh, but if you're a bank and you see the whole situation, you say, well, I'm not gonna lend to a firm because it's not going to pay me back because the economy is horrible, right? So part of the contract in loans that is very typical is to provide a collateral, provide something like an aval, a right? collateral. Now, firms have problems with collateral because what collateral would they, could they provide? The economy was so bad. So the state said, I'm going to provide you with the collateral. So state collateral, national collateral. And there have been a lot of programs given state collateral in many countries. Look at the UK is the green part. Spain, Italy, France, Germany, the Euro area, the longer programs have been really, really key. And you see there, you know, with a very large percentage of GDP. Now, uh, Japan and the USA have been different. They've had some, especially the US had some loan guarantees, but the US did a lot of fiscal spending. And you know how was that fiscal spending at in place? Sometimes sending at home. And these two check at home, and 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 that's how it is. Right. This is the EU reconstruction plan. This is the big uh, the, the the Biden new president, new administration, huge fiscal plan. It's a new new deal. You know what the new deal is? Yeah. You've heard in the 1930s, yeah. right? So we're talking about a new new deal, right? Twice new, right? Because it's supposed to be also. It's not only checks. There's also going to be government expenditures probably put into new industries such as digital firms and clean energies and all this. So this is part of the phase two. Uh, well, this is something that I think is very interesting, right? When you do fiscal policy, uh, this graph I think is really fascinating. Eh? Uh, let's look at uh, this, let's look at this graph, right? And this is from the New York Times. Now, when they were sending these checks, because Trump administration also sent some checks, I think it was $400, right? And now Biden is going to send another check. Again, fiscal policy, 
Why are the, send, the checks sent? What is the idea of sending checks, the fiscal policy, as a response to the crisis? Yes. Create demand through spending, consumption spending. Very good. Now, think about, OK, each one of these columns, it goes from low income to high income. And this is how much of that, those $400 checks in the Trump administration were spent. What can you see here? These are confidence intervals. Uh, what can you see? Who is spending them? High income or the low income? The low income. Why? Because they are really like, <laughs> it's so hard for them to survive. And all of a sudden, they get $400 and they spend right away. How about a rich pe person that received $400? So, well, look, I'm rich anyway. I may even say that. This is why it's very important to target fiscal policy to people who really need it. And that's really what's going to accelerate the economy, as he's saying, because if you spend more, you consume more, firms make more money, firms hire more people, then uh, people have more wage income, and they spend, and this is a virtuous circle going on, right? So fiscal policy is not only about giving more money to everybody, but give more money to people who really need it. Okay. So indeed, people with low income are the ones that mostly uh, um, lost jobs, actually, because they were very much affected and they have different difficulties in, in, finding, in finding jobs, and they haven't really recovered that yet. Impact recovery. Um, this is the second quarter, yearly drop in GDP. So this is, let's say, second quarter of 2020 versus second quarter of 2019 year-over-year year growth. You see, countries which lost the most, so this is second quarter, so is, this is not the 11% that I was saying before. India, 23%, Spain, 22 So we're silver medal, okay? It's because, like I said, it's very much affected by the crisis, okay, 22%. But then other European countries too, UK, France, Mexico, so on, so on. Only China was doing relatively okay. So and actually this year is gonna, uh, uh, 2020 grew positively. This is the last forecast that I think have been uh, put out there by the, uh, by the IMF. And we see 2020, there are still projections because in March probably we will have the actual data, right? Because you have to still, project GDP is quarterly, so it takes time to collect and see exactly, sorry, you know, what are going to be the drop of GDP. 2020, uh, so the world output, the world dropped 4.4. Advanced economy is very much affected. You see here Spain. Minus 12.8, so even higher, uh, although this probably is going to be a bit lower. 12, 11 point, but we still, we don't know. Uh, Italy 10, 9, uh, uh, Germany 6. This is what I said, Germany less affected than Spain because of the nature of its, its economy. Also it's Japan, UK, Canada, other advanced economies. And uh, you see the recovery, right? This is uh, GDP trajectories. China goes down and then uh, it, 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 it's going to recover faster, right? So it's, it's kind of the paradox of all this. The, the, the health crisis started in China and they're recovering fast. This is also because uh, in terms of health, people, uh, let's say, respond. Uh, if the government says, okay, you have to stay at home for three months, don't do anything. People stay at home for three months because the population are much like that. And therefore, being able to kind of mitigate the virus in a more efficient way. We've just seen it also in countries like Australia, South Korea, they're very much like that. Here, for instance, in Christmas, we start to you know, mingle together and then again a third wave, this kind of thing. This is one of, one of the reasons why this is happening. You see an interesting thing? This is real time. This is not GDP, real time indicators of economic activity. Maybe, well, there's a lot of colors here, but you have US, Japan, Germany, France, and so on, and Spain. So Spain here is the difference, you see? In, in the first wave, April last year, it was the country most affected, okay? Uh, there. But a good thing is, however, that the second wave, it was not as affected, okay? So we've done relatively okay in the last wave, in the last, let's say, Christmas, whereas other countries that were not as affected, like this blue one, uh, which I think it is, uh, well, uh, the US, and uh, I think the pink one, Canada, they've been, they've been more affected. Industry recovers faster than services. This is personal consumption expenditures. It's almost back to normal. This is almost like a perfect V. Industry 
can recover because they keep producing things, okay? Services has recovered, but not as much. Okay, these are data from the US. And this is really super interesting, I think. You see what happened during the summer? Uh, and, and this is something, okay, the crisis has not affected every industry the same, right? Think about Zoom, okay? So uh, what happened with Zoom? Did you know Zoom before the crisis? No, no I didn't. I was using Skype myself, more, more, more common. So the market value of Zoom was largest, this to be this is data from the summer, but this was true in the summer. Okay? The, the, the stock market value of Zoom is the same that airlines combined. Southwest, Delta, United, IAG, Iberia is, Lufthansa, and American Airlines, I think, and this I don't know. So all of them. So why is this happening? Why is Zoom so much more valuable than all these airlines that we talk about? That's right. The demand for airlines has dropped a lot, so their value has dropped a lot, right? However, Zoom's value has increased a lot because now people ho are home workers or telework, or things like this. Think about these two graphs again. This is stock market NASDAQ versus IBEX 35. What is the NASDAQ? Technology firms. You see technology, so when the COVID crisis comes, actually it drops from 10,000 to, th to, to, to 7,000. So it drops a lot, 30%. But what happens already in May, right? When we're getting out of the confinement, it goes back to normal, and now it's even higher, right? So it's as if in the course of a year, the COVID has been good for technological firms. Why? Because we're using them all the time. We're using them all the time, right? So this sector has been a sector that is doing well because of the COVID. Other sectors like tourism, Spain, look at that. You know, it hasn't really recovered much. Again, this is data from the summer. How about this? What is this? Zoom, right? We, School of Economics and Business, close, although after two weeks we could go back to work, but, but, but the students return home. And then sometimes we meet every two or three years, uh, sorry, two or three times a year, we meet all the professors, the big uh, claustro professors and uh, and then we started to meet uh, online right and our way of working has changed and this is gonna have profound implications for some economic sectors for instance tell me where kind of networking is gonna have an effect well think about now now in the middle of the cities often a lot of rentals for offices because people go there and meet in If now you can do but not every meeting in the future will be online, because in person is important. For instance, classes in person, we've noticed that are much better than classes in person, right? Or Zoom classes. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I mean, university is the same. Nobody likes them, but it was the only alternative, right? So, so uh, but there will be you know, a lot of online meetings, and then you don't have to go to the office, and then people will demand less office space in the cities, and therefore probably the price of office space and real estate will down. People will move to other places which are cheaper. So it's gonna start some dynamics that are, are really interesting. How are we doing in terms of time? Five. Five minutes, Five. good. Wow, so I'm going, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm covering a lot of ground. I mean, I'm very happy to take any of your questions, eh, by the way. But okay, so let's continue, emerging markets. Again, IMF projections. How are emerging markets gonna do? Uh, well, so emerging markets have been he heavily hit. Right? So, because the globalization world we live in, for think about South American countries, right? It depends a lot on global demand. If rich countries are down, then that's affecting Latin America, Mexico minus nine percent, Brazil minus five point eight, and the same thing also if you go to Asia or Africa is similar. India, you know, very much, very much affected. Only China seem to be positive. Uh, China and the other, there, there's some other countries that got positive growth. Uh, Chile also. The reason is that Chile, there is a of commodities and they, they are doing relatively okay also with vaccines. It's a very, it's in America that that's relatively well with it. The emerging economies very much integrated in global. Think about Spain, Latin America, right? So, we're not in a world, guys, this is important, where it's stupid, for instance, for a country like Spain to say, oh, France is doing bad. Yeah, great, you know, Spain is doing better. Than 
this is, this is not a good way to think about globalization. If Spain, France is doing bad, that's bad to Spain. Why? That's right, because of the trade. It's our biggest trading partner. So it's good that France is doing good, because they're going to demand right? So it's win-win. So if France is doing bad, then it's bad for the economy, right? So likewise for the whole economy, right? Trade has also dropped, you see. Uh, the uh, dro uh, trade dropped uh, in the 2008 crisis, and it's dropping, and there's two scenarios, and both the scenarios in this, in this uh, case. The dependency on commodities, let me new cap net capital outflows. This is important, right? This is the financial part. So all of a sudden, financial investors realize that, wow, in the middle of COVID, put your money. Home. That's right. Safe assets. So assets that are safer. Put them in emerging economy doing so bad? No. So they're pulling out their assets. America, putting them in technological terms, right? So you see the outflow capital, right? Those countries, and this is very important for these countries, right? This is comparing COVID-19 with the previous crisis, 2008. From those, because they need capital, because they generate funding their own capital. So that's right there. Let me. Uh, interest rates increase in these countries because they are riskier. Large currency depreciation, right? Investors sell assets in these countries, right? Assets of South Africa, Mexico, Brazilian, Turkish, South Korea, they sell those assets, their currency depreciation. This can be good or this can be very bad. If you're a country that imports a lot of things, it's very bad that your currency depreciates because you are dependent on a relatively strong currency. Okay. Syrian problems to pay uh, external debts. And here, these countries, they don't have strong central banks. So they need to rely on global institutions such as the IMF to help them. IMF and the World Bank. And the, and the IMF has done its job, stepping up to the plate and really helping these, these, these countries. Debt relief, so that they don't have to pay back their debt for some time. They defer the payment. OK, Argentina wants to do a partial default. These countries have uh, very, very vulnerable in terms of public health. Think about this thing in India, you know. Maintain social distance here. <sighs> so difficult, right? Well, financial markets, and with this I will, will finish. VIX, financial volatility, people selling. VIX increased a lot, level even higher than global financial crisis. Uh, and you see here how. Uh, Price to earning ratios, stock price divided by earnings. Countries USA, Germany, Italy, see all of them go down and then they increase. The US market has been remarkable. It has recovered. Okay, all the countries like Spain hasn't, right? But bond yields, what happens with bond is credit spread. The credit spread is the difference of uh, different assets with respect to a safe asset, right? This comes interest rates increase. Why? Because there is something in fact is critical. What is that relation between risk and reward. very good risk and return, risk and reward? If there is higher risk because of the COVID crisis, then you demand higher return because there is more uncertainty. You see? Now we're going back to normal, but still, you know, uh, some interest rates are very high, and that is very bad for government because they have to pay, pay higher interest rates for companies, and that slows down the economy again. Transmission from finance to the real part of the economy. Again, interest rates. Monetary policy rates, all of them went down, you see, uh, at the same time, boom, interest rates went down. Just because, uh, you know, one part of, uh, one of the things that, they, that, that the uh, monetary policy makers do is to manage the interest rate to help out the economy. Okay, equity markets, you see, for instance, you know, many of them went down, they've kind of recovered in emerging economies. These are the depreciations. And there's a huge, so something probably I didn't emphasize enough is that government institutions and, and policy institutions have reacted a lot. And this is the size of interventions of the buying bonds, buying assets to inject it into the economy and support firms, government. You see red is the Federal Reserve 
Blue is, is uh, the European Central Bank. You see, they've purchased a lot of assets to really give confidence to the economy, even much more than they had done before, right? And, and, and uh, well, banks have suffered a lot in general from, from the crisis. You see, uh, for instance, BBB suffered a lot. Now it's kind of recovering. Santander, you saw, from, let's say, four euros per share to, uh, you know, it, it was two. Now it's, it's, it's increasing. Deutsche Bank doing relatively better. Citigroup. Why are banks suffering from the crisis? Why? Are so the stock market reflects the reality of the returns. Why are banks? Yes? Uh, no, no one is for. There's no connectivity. They're not getting back the loans. They're not getting back the loans. They're defaults. So it's bad times for banks at a time of low interest rates, competition from fintechs, high regulation. Final thoughts. Great hangover of public and private debts. You see a lot of that, you know, for governments and, 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 small, and, 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 and also small firms. The faults of private firms could be contagious for banks. That's exactly what we were talking about. This is why banks are not doing good. There are mergers, Kaisha and Bankia. They're why? Because on its own, they're not doing so well, right? So maybe they put together and one helps the other and they restructure, they can do better. This is the reason why mergers. You know, I think the, the fallout is a lot of government expenditures. Well, inflation, this is something that people are talking about, talking about this week. Maybe you heard it in the media because there is a lot of fiscal policy, a lot of monetary policy, you know, a lot of expense, a lot of demand. It, this could lead to inflation. I think globalization, a, glo a managed globalization, right? I think Trump policies and Brexit really have put a kind of break in globalization. And I think going forward, the battle for technological dominance is going to be key for, for, for global geopolitics. U.S., China, the big tech, this is where the action is going to regulate them. Should we not? They are so powerful now. They are doing everything. I mean, good. So I think that's right. You have any questions? Thank you. I don't know if there is more time, but I, I'm very happy to take any of your questions. We have to go, whatever you... We have to go. Okay, we have to go, but...